I will be using Dietrich Bonhoeffer as the key focusing device for our spiritual journey. Now, you may or may not know much about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He is this famous Lutheran minister and theologian who resisted the rise of Hitlerism in Germany, and because of his resistance, he was executed. He believed there is a clear choice. You can either be a Christian or you can be a national socialist, but you can't be both. And he died for that belief. Let me give you a little more about his life. He was born in 1906 in Germany, but that's an area we now call Poland. And he was born to be great. I mean, the genes were all lined up. His dad was the most famous psychiatrist in Germany, one of the most renowned scientists in Germany. His brother split atoms with Albert Einstein, one of the top physicists in Germany. His other brother was the top lawyer in Germany. This dude had the genes, okay? And he was born with a high intellect. You could tell right away. He received his PhD at 21 years old, and he knew he wanted to be a Lutheran minister, but you can't get ordained until you're 25 at that time in Germany. So he had, at 21, all his terminal degrees, and he, he had to wait. And so he went to Barcelona and was an assistant pastor there. And then he took a fellowship at Union Theological in New York City, and something happened to him. In those first weeks, he visited a black Baptist church in Harlem, and he was blown away. He had never seen a faith that was so authentic and fully expressive. He was used to the sort of rarefied German metaphysical religion, and he suddenly realized that faith could be real in a community. All year long then, he taught a little Sunday school class at that church because he was so amazed. So we went back to Germany, suddenly feeling like the faith had to be real. You had to live it out. A few years later, his brother-in-law recruited him to become part of the resistance. At one point, Dietrich Bonhoeffer decided that he would become part of the plot to assassinate Hitler. And this was a wrenching decision. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was never sure if it was the right decision, but he felt he had to act. But you know that conspiracy failed. The Gestapo discovered that he was part of this. A knock came on the door. He was arrested, his sister arrested, the brother-in-law sent to prison. They spent two years in concentration camps. In the final months, and we're now in 1945, the war is almost over, but he's aware that he might not make it. By all accounts, in the prison, he was this calm pastoral presence that was there for others. In those last months, he became especially centered and took care of those around him, and then Himmler sent the order to execute him just a couple weeks before the Allies liberated that camp. The eyewitnesses say, as Bonhoeffer stepped up onto the gallows, they hung their fellow Germans, they're not gassing there. As he stepped up onto the gallows, he said this, this is the end but it is my beginning. He believed in the life eternal, and he believed that he was making a sacrifice that mattered. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is this stunning example of moral 
courage. But my friends, even as we lionize a sterling example like this, know that there are people all over the world displaying moral courage this hour. Think of the people of Ukraine. Think of people all over the world facing suffering and, and, and showing courage. Think of all the people in the struggle for justice around the world showing moral courage. So even as we lionize an individual, remember with me, it's never just about individuals. I'm beginning today a three-part sermon series on moral courage. To the ancient philosophers, courage was the primary virtue. You had to have courage to display all the other virtues. So it was first. Unless you had courage, you wouldn't actually live up to being just, of being compassionate. You need the courage, then you can be your best self. You see, you have a conscience. And this is an amazing thing. You have a conscience. You innately know what is right. This is amazing. You don't need to be told by someone else what is right because you have a conscience. You have this native goodness. You know the right thing to do. You just know it. But here's the thing. The conscience is very fragile. And it's easily overwhelmed by anxiety and fear. And when we become anxious and scared, we begin to self-protect. And, and we lose moral courage. So the first step in courage is to calm ourselves, to become calm and then steal ourselves. You know the right thing, and you must do it. In 1937, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been, come back to Germany. Hitlerism was rising to full fury. In 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had already gone on the radio to oppose the rise of the Fuhrer. That type of authoritarianism was unchristian, so he was already in the crosshairs of the Nazis. In 1937, he published a masterwork, now a Christian classic, called The Cost of Discipleship. And in this book, he says this, that he is tired and frustrated with Christians who think that beliefs about Jesus are so important. He said, it's not critical what your beliefs about Jesus are. What matters is, will you follow Him? Oh, he was so frustrated by the high German church with its wonderful metaphysical elaborations about what a, a good Christian should believe about Jesus but then now they were failing to follow Jesus. For Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the critical gospel text is Matthew chapter 4. You remember when Simon and Andrew, the two brothers, are casting their nets, and then Jesus comes walking by and says to them, follow me. And immediately they drop their nets and follow. For Bonhoeffer, what is critical here is there's no calculation. There's no thinking about or theorizing about, the type of theorizing that puts you at once removed from life. No calculation. They drop their nets and follow. There was some intrinsic moral authority, this moral perfection that was a vision in Jesus Christ. They drop the nets and follow. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said, religion itself can become a diversion with all its beliefs about Jesus, all its calculations, instead of following Him. 
So in this first sermon of the series, let me ask of our own denomination, our own tribe of Christians, the same question he asked. Is there some way that we are staying once removed from Jesus and caught up in our theories? Let me discuss our own tribe. You know, we are the United Church of Christ, the Congregational Church, and remember, we have a proud history. We were the pilgrims on the Mayflower. That's why it's called Mayflower Hall and Pilgrim Hall, and they landed at Plymouth Rock. You remember, that's why it's Plymouth Church, and, and, and you remember that they began the first church in America, and it was based on spiritual democracy, the idea that you don't need authoritarian structures and bishops, that each congregation is its own democracy, and we believed that there was a freedom of the individual conscience, that you must come to know God and Christ in your own way, that the church shouldn't impose creeds upon you, because if you're forced to give your assent to a creed, that's not real faith. Rather, you have to discover your sense of God, your sense of Christ, and then in community, share it. We became a congregation, a tribe of Christians that valued the intellect and the life of the mind. We believed that you could take the best insights of science and the moral verdicts of the day, and you could fold that into faith, philosophy, and ethical reflection. You could bring that into your Christian faith. We, we valued the life of mind so much, we founded Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and Cal Berkeley, and we became this really sensible religion. Oh, do you not feel it, my brothers and sisters? We're the sensible ones, and there is a decorum to our faith. But is it possible? Is it possible that now we are most proud of our elaborate and intellectually sustainable beliefs about Jesus? And we have forgotten to encounter Jesus. Is it possible that we have put ourselves at once removed Oh, my friends, the gospel is all about encounter, all about an encounter with Jesus, and when you encounter the Christ, you have a decision to make. Will you follow or not? Oh, and there is drama. Do you feel it? You have this decision. And you have a conscience. You know what is right, but the question still becomes, will you follow Him? Or will we observe Jesus? Or will we, will we admire Jesus but not be a follower of Jesus? Dietrich Bonhoeffer never mentioned this. But what I think is key about Matthew 4, it wasn't just one person alone having to make that decision. There were two. And it's wherever two or three gather. It's in community that together we can calm ourselves and steel ourselves to be followers of Jesus, to encounter Him and choose to follow. My friends, in these days, in these chaotic, tumultuous, morally ambiguous days, we need to follow Him. Will you follow? Follow. 